First of all, I should start by saying that I was uh, 100% right about my prediction last week. Highest viewed episode, and I don't think it has anything to do with me. My conspiracy theory was right. But maybe we can get into that with my guest today, who you can find on the uh, Irish Goodbye podcast and is special on this very YouTube. Just go, stop watching right now. Go watch Life Begins with Mike Cannon and then come <laughs> back and watch the rest of this. Mike Cannon, what's up, buddy? What's up, dude? How you doing, man? Thanks for having me. Um, before we get started, do you want to just get out of the way now? Is there anything in your past that you would like to apologize <laughs> for before you make it, like no. make it huge, which I think you're going to? Buddy, I they're... want to know on the record, what have you done? <laughs> How many times have you done blackface? How many times? Have... I know you've used the N-word because you've been on Legion of Skanks. So I did. Well, assuming. believe it or not, they've all used it joyously around me. I've. Uh... That's what I'll get you. <laughs> Yeah, I've, <laughs> I've I've put up the cross with my fingers each time a slur was uttered, and uh, you know I, I've never done blackface. Oddly enough, I've never uh, I've never found an appropriate occasion. Isn't it funny that if they can't find the N word tape, they'll just go look at this guy laughing, <laughs> yeah, not oh, exactly. stopping the merriment as it's said. Yeah, right. Just lubricating a social situation so he's not the <laughs> stick in the mud. What a piece of shit. What do you think about all the uh, all the shit going on right now? Because there's times where I get really mad about it and rant about it on Twitter and all that shit. But then there's times where I'm like, maybe it's so big of an issue because people like me get mad about it and tweet about it. So yeah. where, where do you stand on all that shit? I definitely think that's part of it. I think comedians are our own best and worst PR agents because any news story, anything, you know, it, it, whatever happenings, social happenings in the comedy community, typically nobody on earth could give a shit or or and they don't know about it. But comedians sometimes tweet so much and lather a situation up so much and defend it, defend it, share posts, share blogs, share all this shit that typically would never get eyes on it but because we're such hysterical sensitive cunts it uh you know it, it gets seen by more people yeah but it is it's getting to a point where now people are just outing themselves like we've seen yeah. fucking yeah, poor yeah. jenny slate did nothing wrong <laughs> she was doing a voice on a cartoon <laughs> that was funny she got hired to do that job and right. she's like i can't believe i cannot believe what i did i regret my decision to do this role it's like what the fuck are you talking about not to mention, I'm sure you did not donate your entire earnings to any black causes. So no. if you actually felt that way, why'd you get the part in the first place? It's such performative horseshit, in my opinion. Yeah. It's it's uh, it's it's almost like what is that cosmetic? It's it's not actual change. It's just cosmetic, you know, just to appease. Yeah, well, there's I mean, we've been kind of uh, at, at war with people, even like at Barstool that we work with that mm -hmm. when all the protests were going down, you had. Uh, certain people that work here tweeting out, you know, like white girls or whatever, white guys, whatever, tweeting out lists of books you should read to be more progressive and sure. causes you can donate to that they obviously didn't research. And then a week later, they're back to makeup tutorials. And it's like, OK, was this? <laughs> did you really give a shit about this or was it your cause right. of the day to look woke? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's 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 one of those things. The balance is kind of tricky to find. Right. Because when the news story is fresh, it's all that takes over your brain so obviously you're gonna like you know you might be inspired about jokes or to tweet donations and stuff like that but yeah i mean if you're really interested in helping the cause hopefully it's just a part of your life to be you know to donate or to spread awareness and not just when it's a fucking hot button issue well uh, and it really affected i know you're uh, an always sunny fan right yeah yeah but absolutely. now it's affecting our lives because they took episodes of sunny away from us did they really? Oh, oh yeah, you know, yeah. Um, uh, they took down episodes of Thirty Rock, The Golden Girls, and I think the two episodes of Sunny where uh, they do Lethal Weapon and they use blackface. Oh right, those yeah. are scrubbed from existence now. So it's kind of like, all right, now you can't even comment on those. Like if you watch those episodes, right? The commentary is obviously look at these assholes thinking it's okay to do blackface. Yeah. But now you can't even make fun of that person that does that. So it's a weird time. It, that is very bizarre that like contextually it is it's mocking blackface and it's calling people that use right. blackface ignorant idiots. So the message is actually pretty woke, but people are so contextually retarded <laughs> that it it like doesn't matter anymore. The teaching point is nullified. It's just the fact that it existed needs to be scrubbed clean. But also, don't you kind of like don't you expect networks to be pussies at this point? It's like I I get it. You got to you really have to just completely appease across the board and not be you know not sway either way on being offensive so i i kind of get why they would do that yeah i can understand to a point but now it's getting to where like you're outing yourself like did you do you know who jenna marbles is yeah 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 look, look up that apology if you haven't seen it 
but it's I saw basically part of her. It. It's basically her like cutting her wrists, <laughs> saying, "Listen, before you guys find these videos, I did these, and uh, I'm very embarrassed by it." And my favorite part is like she had some rap lyric in a song she did, mm-hmm. and she's repeating it back. She's like, "If you haven't seen it." When I said the phrase ching chong ding dong, I did not realize how it could hurt people. And it's like, what the fuck are we doing? Oh my God. Yeah, I I, I watched part of the apology, but her glasses were so crooked it bothered my OCD. <laughs> and I was like, all right, I, I, I truly can't pretend to even give a shit. But I was reading comments and you know, for for her audience to her audience's credit. A lot of people were being like, she's grown, she's changed. She's, you know, those those videos were, were a long time ago and she's since deleted or privated them. And, you know, they're no longer on the Internet. And she's made, you know, adjustments in how she approaches life and social situation and all that stuff. It's like she's made adjustments and has grown. And isn't that the goal? Yeah. <laughs> you know, not to live some fucking some puritanical life where you make no mistakes and you are just a pristine, innocent person from moment from the moment you're born till you're dead. That doesn't exist. Well, that, this is the theory I've been running with now that I don't, I'm curious your take on it. Like when Jimmy Kimmel or I'll use Jimmy Kimmel as the example, when he says mm. like, I've evolved from when he did quote blackface as Carl Malone. Right. He's like, I've evolved and I've changed and I've grown. And my thought is you're kind of saying, when I did that, I was racist, and now I'm not. Whereas sure. I don't think Jimmy Kimmel was ever ever had racist intentions when he did that, so you didn't really evolve or change. You just no. thought it was funny then, and now you're not really allowed to find it funny. Yeah, I think for somebody like him, who I have, I mean, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but I have I don't know him. I, you know, he hosted right, right. the Man Show, so that I guess right. can be considered misogynistic and sexist. But yeah. like, you know, for the most part, he has shown, you know kind of different views of himself and what he thinks socially. And it's like, I, I, I think the time has evolved. It's okay to be like, hey, I think the con- the filter in which we consume comedy and the lens that we look through and how we view comedy now as opposed to back then is completely different and this doesn't play. So yeah, the bit hasn't evolved with the time and therefore it's no longer good. Yeah. And then, but then I wonder, I was, uh, we had a uh, Feeney on a few weeks ago uh, mm. from uh, Irish Goodbye. And we were talking about the episode you guys did. I think you called it the petty episode uh-huh. where you found literally just some YouTube commenter <laughs> asshole that was a dick to you guys and exposed him, which I fucking love. Yeah. Um, but that shit like that makes me wonder like how much of it is social media where if we just deleted Twitter and Instagram, would we even know this shit is happening? Well, now, I mean, you know, now it's so weird because people are, you know, due to an extended lockdown and, and you know, COVID, the stresses of losing work and, you know, all that stuff. I think people are truly teetering on the on the sword's edge of their fucking sanity. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you, you see all these different videos of quote unquote Karens and, you know, throwing groceries out of their cart and just, you know, having a fucking episode <laughs> right. in public. And it's like, yeah, I. I don't know, man. I think Twitter has suddenly like bled into reality where it used to be, you know, oh, I I, Twitter is is the seventh circle of hell. It's a violent nightmare. And then you step out and birds are chirping and everybody's hugging each other. But now you're like, wow, Twitter is the seventh circle of hell. What an aggressive place. And you go outside and somebody's frothing at the mouth, screaming about not wearing a mask because their freedom's at stake. Uh, the odd thing, though, is like we in in any sort of entertainment, whether it's podcasting or comedy or whatever, they've kind of made it so that you need it now. And we're also the most sensitive people. Like part yeah. of the reason I'm drawn to a guy like you is you talk about why that stuff bothers you. Yeah, where right. it'll just leave so you fucking an emotional. <laughs> like I could get a million nice comments, and one like you're a piece of shit, you suck, and it just hits every insecurity I have. Oh, yeah, and I'm like you mother, and it ruins my day yet you need it to promote like no one would know i was doing a podcast if i didn't have twitter or instagram dude i like i i think for a while my special has like over three thousand likes and like 116 thumbs down yep. and those thumbs down are like slow stabs into my body <laughs> at all day, like all the time and i know it's i've i've come to terms with how it's emotionally unreasonable to attach myself to that it's intellectually unreasonable some people are just assholes and they don't even you know they, they don't even watch it they just thumb it down whatever yeah. it's like you know i've i've come to terms with that but still i'm such 
an absolute open wound of a human that everything bothers me. <laughs> well, we have um, on this, uh, the YouTube channel you're on right now would be the uh, Kirk Minahan Show Network. Nice. And we do a lot of shit like around the Kirk Minahan Show. Mm -hmm. And um, I do a show where like I interact with fans a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll talk to them and they'll say shit like, hold on a second. I have to thumbs down this video because I was in <laughs> I was in like the room for uh, one of the shows that we do before yeah. it started. And it had five likes and two dislikes, and it had not started yet. Yeah. And yeah, I was like, dude. what is I kind of respect it in a way because mm -hmm. they know it's fucking with us. <laughs> of so course. That's yeah. really the only reason they're doing it. But I'm also like, what a fucking asshole. Why would you do that? Yeah, there's a lot of bad people out there. <laughs> there's just there's just pure cunts. I mean, you know, anybody that does that, that actively seeks somebody out to hurt their feelings, like, you know, either digitally or in real life, you have to understand where that comes from. So while you're getting, you know, while you're laughing about it, you're actually having a real emotional impact on a other on a other person, but you're so isolated and just behind the screen and you can't watch them in pain that it never occurs to people or it does and they get off on it, which is even worse. Are you in uh, therapy? Uh, I'm trying to get back, actually. I, I I texted a therapist, and he's he's given me a waiting period, which I find irresponsible. <laughs> <That's> very <laughs> odd. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's been odd because uh, I just started not that long ago, uh -huh. and I realized, like, oh, all these insane problems I thought I would never get rid of. All I needed was an hour of self indulgence a week where I just pour my problems onto someone and suddenly yeah. I feel better. Like that's all yeah. it really took. It, they, they aren't these like deep, dark issues that I have. It's just, I wasn't talking about it. Anymore. Yeah. I mean, anything that bottles you up, it could actually manifest physically. So not only are you just a total, you know, you could be a twat to people, but also you could then like hurt your elbow because you miss your dad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just, it's such a weird connection of things. But I, you know, I now used to have stand up. Stand up was an outlet every single night where, you know, not only would I get feedback and, you know, some sort of affirmation and stuff like that, but I was getting like focused 100% attention on my personal issues that I was, you know, up there bloviating about. But, you know, so now my poor wife is just on the receiving end of me, you know, without a crowd of people to scream at. Yeah. How's the uh, the kind of forced break from stand up manifested for you? Has it been nice to have a break or is it starting to get where like, all right, this is my career. I need to get back to fucking doing it. Yeah. I mean, I hate it. I hate yeah. not doing it. It's it's not it, I'm I'm terrible in the sense that like I really have attached my my identity, my self worth, like everything that I shouldn't have. I've attached to stand up comedy. It is you know my first over encompassing love. I'm obsessed with it still to this day. I've been doing it for twelve years, and it's just one of those things that like without it, it feel I feel a little limbless at the moment. Like it's an actual physical thing that's been cut out of my life. But uh, I'm I'm looking forward to. It. I'm also terrified you know I'm, I'm i'm doing my first weekend at comics mohegan sun next weekend and you know i i trust that they're going to be as safe as humanly possible but then you look at all these other places that have <laughs> reopened and it, it doesn't look promising i was going to ask how you think it's going to go i'm going i think the first show i have uh tickets for i just bought them for august 15th in providence mm -hmm. and the list of there's nothing that makes comedy more fun than a list of rules and it's yeah. like you know yeah. you're only allowed to buy this number of tickets sit this distance apart so i'm, I'm kind of curious how it's gonna be what do you what are you, your thoughts on it who are you gonna see uh shane gillis oh that's gonna be great he's been on this show before awesome shane's so fucking funny man um i don't know i i think you know, part of it, it could go one of two ways, right? And I think it probably will. I think there will be one of each of these types of shows where it could be people have been cooped up. There's obviously a lot of national stress. It's, you know, if people are out of work, you know, whatever they're dealing with currently, it's going to be a crazy social release to be there, to be with fellow people, you know, having a live experience and just kind of airing it out a little bit for a full fucking hour and just having a good time. And I think there's going to be one of those. And there's probably going to be the people that are like, you know, they came out aggressively. They're probably pissed about masks or, you know, whatever it might be. And their attitude going into it will sour the night and it'll, you know, it could be a fucking rough hoe. Well, did you see it's coming out today? Maybe I'm just reading the wrong stories, mm -hmm. but someone from the CDC said today, like, 
it's just beginning. Like we haven't even gotten into the shit from coronavirus yet. So buckle up, which Dude. is a terrifying prospect. Truly terrifying, not to mention, I saw an article yesterday about another fucking virus in China that could, oh, good. that has pandemic. <laughs> I love how they're like, they're almost like scouting reports on all of these virus. Like, oh, yeah, you know, this one has real some pro prospects. It could it could leap the <laughs> pond and come over to America and shut some shit down. It's like, dude, what a uh, everything seems endlessly stressful. And that's why I'm trying my best, you know, to, you know, I'm an anxious guy. I also have some depression issues, but I'm trying my best to trust fall into the unknown <laughs> and just be like, whatever is going to be is going to be, man. Like, what the fuck? At least we're all doing this together. Are you still you used to do a podcast called uh, Deep Inside the Rabbit Hole? Are you still yeah. a conspiracy theory guy? I still enjoy them. I still yeah. uh, and, you know, I'm like I was on that show. I'm I'm a corruption guy, so I like tangible shit where you can follow the money and like there's some you know like some epstein stuff or some right. it's not that i like that but, but <laughs> don't it's, we it's, all <laughs> it's more interesting to me than like the earth is flat and there's two mile high ice walls at each pole and nobody has ever traversed the arctic and it's like okay all of this is easily disproved and it's now reached game of thrones fantasy level yeah. where you know we are talking about how the rich can completely manipulate and run things i mean you know the simple stock market right now and the fact that billionaires have made so much fucking money while 20 percent of the country is out of work. That's a stock market that is real or that's a conspiracy that is real news happening right in front of us. Right. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's why I set that up to ask you about coronavirus, but it's funny you bring up Jeffrey Epstein, because what I always say is it's not that's not a conspiracy theory. Like everyone. No, yeah. there's not a person on the planet that thinks he killed himself. Yet we're all like, isn't that wacky? Like Jeffrey, right. Epstein, if you watch that documentary. The last episode, like it's it's three pretty decent episodes, and then you get to the fourth one, and it's like, and wouldn't you know it, the camera didn't work, and the guards fell asleep. All right, yep. see you later, folks. It just shows Hillary like whistling through a fucking <laughs> field of flowers. <laughs> but I, yeah, that's like, you know, that's almost like the Jordan doc too, where they kind of they talked about the father, and like they're like, there's absolutely no evidence that Jordan was gambling to the level where it would affect his family. And it's like, actually, there's a ton of evidence. And you named right. some of it two episodes ago where they talked about that one golf guy that like helped Jordan bet hundreds of thousands of dollars on each hole. And it's like, you know, there's some obvious missing pieces there, but I understand why you don't want to chase, you know, that that lead. Right. But I but I don't know, man, I'm I'm into the fact that like, is it man made? Who the fuck knows? It certainly seems like a weird strain of anything to me. Uh, did it escape, you know, that lab intentionally? Was it was it unintentional due to incompetence? Like, you know, I don't know. All of this stuff is kind of interesting. I also go the other way, I guess almost like anti conspiracy theory, which is almost as bad or whatever you want to call it, I guess. Mm. But I've gotten to the point where I'm like, listen, I don't know anyone with this fucking coronavirus. I don't think it's real. <laughs> I like, I'll wear a mask if it makes you feel more comfortable, but I just don't personally have an experience. So it's hard for me to believe it's happening. Right. And then you see the numbers now where it's like more people have it, but it's still only really affecting the elderly in a, in a real harmful way. So yeah, I mean, I, I know, I don't some, know, I know some young people that it has fucked up. My buddy See, Corey. See, no, if I knew that, now I, I feel bad. <laughs> dude, no, no, it's totally fine because I, I'm right there with you. I'm one of those people that, you know, I'll read stuff and take it on good faith, but I don't believe really anything unless I'm there. Right. Yeah, <laughs> which show is me probably, some fucking bodies here. Come yeah, on. Yeah, which, which is probably a terrible quality to have, but, right. you know, whatever. That's that's just who I am. Um, But I've, you know, my buddy who's a uh, who's a rapper, Punk the Bunny, he uh, he got it like a month or two ago and he's still and he technically is testing negative for it now. But he has like extreme bouts of fevers and chest pains and like tightening up. And he hasn't gone like a full week without wild symptoms ever oh, since. Jesus. Yeah. Pretty scary shit. How is it? Uh, how is it affecting your your home life? Because I know you're technically homeless. You have a roof to live under, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. you don't have an actual home right now. No, I'm at my. Uh, we're staying at my mother in law's because we we left the city. Obviously, as uh, you know, as the lockdown started to take place. Because here's the thing, you know, there's jokes about this, and people are like, oh, if you leave the city, you're not allowed back. And it's like, yeah, yeah. cool. I'm definitely lucky and privileged to have an outlet outside of the city <laughs> where I was able to breathe in fresh air every single day. If I was stuck in a two bedroom apartment in Brooklyn with my not yet one year old son <laughs> and my and my wife, 
it, it like I wouldn't be married right now. It'd be a right. fucking nightmare. The simple fact that we have several doors to shut and an outside and like a pool, it dude, I you know, it's it, it's the easiest version of going through this I could think of. Has it been tough though uh, for anyone who hasn't checked out the Irish Goodbye podcast? It's a storytelling show. Sure, which is. You should go check out. Uh, has it been tough? I know you guys have done some stuff like uh, the Alex uh, Bachelorette thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so some stuff like that to to you know get through a few weeks of the coronavirus. But has it been tough now? I worry even when I hear you guys telling stories. I, I live such a mundane life that I'm like in regular times I wouldn't be able to fill an hour with just stories from that week so how has it been been affecting you lately um we've i mean we definitely have leaned on guests a little bit like so we're we're bringing more people on we just had tony hinchcliffe on which was really great mm -hmm. uh before that we had the girls got to eat uh girls they did the finale of the bachelorette and that whole thing was like i mean that was the most fun it was very funny it was just it was just so fun we we just yeah. on the fly decided we were going to do a bachelorette uh where our fans would try to woo over our producer uh, you know, on the fly, figured it out. And that took over like four or five weeks. It was yeah. it was great. And now we're you know, we're getting more guests on and we're trying it. We had Mateo Lane and uh, hopefully their, you know, their appearance and some of their stories will jog, you know, stories that we haven't gotten to forgot or whatever. And, uh, you know, we're just trying to do as much as humanly possible. It's definitely difficult because, you know, we're not living a normal life, but now that things are starting to open up, at least around us, you know, hopefully at least one or two big things happen to us per week. I did like in the uh, in one of the Bachelorette episodes, you guys had a contestant that was just like, you know what? On second thought, I have no interest in dating <laughs> Alex anymore. I'm, I'm just going to I'm going to take myself out of this competition. <laughs> Dude, I'm telling you, that might be like a top five hardest I've ever laughed moments <laughs> in my life. I it just I did not expect that at all. He just was like, I withdraw myself from consideration, <laughs> uh, just to see the hurt on our producer's face. <laughs> it, was so, it was just beautiful. Um, speaking of the podcast, you guys have actually been, in a way, kind of a, a bad influence on me because I've, you know, I uh, not that I grew up listening to the Irish Goodbye podcast. I'm a little older now, sure. but I've always listened to podcasts like that where it's uh, kind of a loose hang. Sometimes you guys will drink, like you did the. Uh, the hundredth episode where you guys hour, did the hour. power hour or whatever. Oh yeah. So I guess instinctively, I kind of always grew up thinking like I could have a, I could have a few pops and do a podcast. <laughs> yeah. And then we did a live show this past February and it almost ruined my life. Like I almost got fired. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> I fucking, I ruined the live show. I was so fucked up and slurring my words and shit. And it was <laughs> a humiliating experience. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to ask you is how you're able, not that you're, you know, blackout drunk necessarily when you're performing but how are you able to even just do a podcast when you're like drinking or doing drugs <laughs> so i i actually haven't drank now in almost 19 months i right. guess so i mean i've had plenty of those experiences where i was blackout drunk on a podcast and it went well or it went terribly yeah. deep inside the rabbit hole there are a bunch of episodes where i am pissed drunk screaming <laughs> at the conspiracy theorist guy slurring my words just calling him a piece of shit you know everything under the sun and it's wildly embarrassing but it's one of those things that i like I don't know. I'm an idiot. So if I do, if I do really rise up and my profile gets bigger, there's a lot of things out there that could definitely like don't paint me in the best light. But right. I intentionally kept them up because I do also feel like it's a progression and a journey. And, you know, as cheesy as that is, but it's like my life has not been a linear, perfect thing. I've gone through a lot of phases where I've been a terrible human being. And I think my current version of myself is the best. But I'm hopeful that in the future, I'll look back at this and also consider myself a terrible human being. <laughs> it's, the, it's the only way you can checkpoint yourself, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, that's why. But that's also part of why. I stopped drinking was, you know, one, I did it because my wife was pregnant and I wanted to do it in solidarity with her. And then post pregnancy, I didn't think I could be an effective father, even remotely hungover. So I kept that. And, you know, now he's one and I could probably get away with having a few, but I like how my brain's firing. I, I don't like being fat. I don't like being hungover <laughs> and uh, smoking weed is has been great yeah. <laughs> you know <laughs> do you do you miss it at all because i did the same thing where uh when i had that incident mm. i was like well this almost ruined my life so maybe time for a, a break from drinking and uh i kind of luckily i don't have that in me where if 
I'm with someone that cracks a Bud Light open. I'm tugging at their belt buckle for a sip. Yeah, yeah. I don't have that in me, luckily. Um, I do miss just socially being a little more at ease, I guess. But it was nice to kind of find like, okay, I don't need to get fucked up to live my life, which is good to know, I guess. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, uh, I mean, it's, I, so I had, I had that in me where like, if I was, if I was around people that were drinking and I set out that night not to drink, I'd be like, nah, I'm fucking drinking. Like, right. you know, and I, it would always be a good time. I wasn't really an angry drunk or an aggressive one. I would only get aggressive with Brendan Sagalow. Just, I just <laughs> pinch his tits and punch his fucking guts <laughs> for whatever reason. But, uh, you know, for the most part, I was just kind of like sloppy and it would ruin my next day that, you know, that's it. Yeah. But, yeah. but now, socially i mean weed is almost like cigarettes at this point you know anytime right. i get into a conversation that i am not interested in i'm like i'm gonna go smoke weed i <laughs> <laughs> uh, just get i turn around and go outside and smoke pot it's funny you say that though just because the weed for me is much more like i'll now i'll kind of smoke before bed or something like mm-hmm. i can't go out and function yeah it's just gotten to the point where it's not like you know rolling a joint when you were in high school anymore. It's like if you take edibles or vape or anything, you're fucking toast. Like you have to yeah. delve. When I when I see like uh, I'll watch like Joey Diaz's podcast and they'll say he's doing like a thousand milligrams or something. Dude, I don't understand how that's humanly possible. Yeah, that's not on my radar. I mean, a thousand milligrams is is that is Herculean. I don't <laughs> I don't understand the capacity to do that. I take. I mean, the other night. I have this syringe thing. It's not a needle, but it's a syringe that pushes out like pure CBD wax. Mm-hmm. And so the, I think the whole thing is thousands and thousands of milligrams. So I have no idea what each drop is or how much I'm squirting <laughs> into my mouth. I have to kind of like play it by ear. And I remember the last time I didn't get high enough. So I overtook it this time and I was in bed just hallucinating for real hallucinating. And I just turned to my wife and I was like, hey, just a heads up. I'm too high which I'm never too high. So she turned to me and was like, what? Like, are you okay? (laughs) And I'm like, I'm too high. I don't need any type of special treatment. I'm more than okay weathering the storm alone. I just am going to need to keep the TV on. (laughs) Is there a, whether it's, you know, drinking or drugs or otherwise, is there a story that now that you have a kid, you Mm. wish you hadn't told? Like you wish you, is there anything you've said that you wish you didn't put out there? Uh, That's a good question. I mean, I, I don't know. I not or really. not necessarily because you have a kid. Just in general, I guess. You definitely not because I have a kid. Because yeah. I think I think the one thing that I hope to do and continue to do is my with my kid is be transparent and and hopefully fill him in with as much of, from my life as possible, and he could take those lessons or do it. You know, do with them what they will. But I knew nothing about my dad's childhood. I knew nothing about my dad's twenties. You know, so <laughs> so like I would be fascinated to hear those kind of stories, but whatever. And I always, I always wanted that kind of thing. So hopefully my son, you know, listens to me and is like, Oh, you know, Oh, my dad was a little bit of a dick and then adjusts his behavior accordingly, (laughs) you know, I don't know. But so nothing, uh, nothing you can think of that you wish you didn't have out there. Even that, uh, like maybe that fans reference a lot that you're like, okay, I've heard enough of that. Oh, my phone number. Oh, <laughs> I wish, okay. That's probably I wish a I good... never said, yeah. I wish Have I you never changed said it my or not? No, of course not. And every <laughs> once in a while, every once in a while, I'll get some fucking weirdo text, you know, and I can change it on my phone. I think it's like literally the laziest transition to make, but it, it's, uh, you know, I set it on deep inside the rabbit hole drunkenly. So still every once in a while, I'll get a text message, be like, is this still Mike? <laughs> I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> but I'll answer it. Our producer, Steve Robinson, did that. A co- I think he's given out his phone number a couple times by accident. Nice. So all the fans have his have his phone number. And now there's just times of day where he doesn't answer his phone because he knows it's the fans calling. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a strange way to live life. It's a strange way, but also a good gauge for that you actually have fans. It's great. That's, that's true. You know, like, oh, um, people are calling. You, uh, you mentioned your dad, and I'm fascinated by your guys' relationship. How's yeah. Is there has there been any change there? Are you guys still not on speaking terms, or how's that going? So we we're we're not spe- we're we're not audibly speaking. We haven't had a okay. phone call or anything like that. We have uh, texted, kind of like you know, just shallow shit. Like, how are you? Are you making it through quarantine? Okay, I've sent him pictures of my son. He has yet to meet him. Uh, you know, we've had a contentious, complicated, and violent past together. So it's uh, it's always. I'm always uneasy to restart things. And I kind of, you know, I, my expectations are at zero. So I don't, 
I don't expect really much out of him. I just uh, I would like it to be neutral. If that what's, makes sense. What's the root of that? Because you have stories where you guys got into like genuine fist fights, right? Yeah, yeah. We got into a fist fight when I was I I mean when I was in college. I was also on steroids, so we picked a bad time to do that. <laughs> but uh I, you know, I was visiting my girlfriend at the time at Syracuse and I was at a junior college playing basketball and I was kind of looking where I was I would now spend the next two years of my college. My parents were like, if you go to this junior college, community college, um, will pay for any school you get into. I had a great GPA. I had 393. So I basically, the world was my oyster. I came home. I told my parents I wanted to go to Ithaca. My father screamed that it was like, nope, SUNY. Only SUNY. And so we got into a fucking nose-to-nose screaming match. He tried to throw an uppercut at me, and I just zoned in, saw it coming, punched down on his forearm, which probably hurt more than the actual, you know, eventual face face. punch but i punched down on his forearm and then like crow hopped and fucking nailed him right in his goddamn irish head and uh you know he was like 265 270 at the time so he stumbled back 10 feet and then i ran out of the house and uh didn't come back for four days because i was too scared (laughs) now i'm hung up on the most mundane part of that story yeah does he have school pride for suny or what is the (laughs) just because it was because it's uh cheaper Oh, okay. so because it's a state school, he was like, nope, you're only going to a state school. You're okay. only, you I know, we're not saying the, the cannons bleed Sunni blue. Or yeah, no, it, 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 it's like I, my dad put in absolutely zero effort in terms of my education, in terms of like making sure my work got done and then also helping me look for college. Like he couldn't have been less involved or interested. So the the fact that he even knew what a Sunni was is almost impressive and endearing to me. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was the story? I forget now. Did he, did he show up at your special uninvited or something? Your yeah, special of course. Life Begins on YouTube? Yeah. He, uh, yeah, Life Begins at Mike Cannon Comedy on YouTube. But he, <laughs> um, he, we, so we hadn't spoken since my baby shower because he, you know, picked a bunch of fights with my sister, started screaming about Trump and making all these political crazy, you know, just picking fights, right. you know, uh, talking about Alexandra occasional cortex and like, you know, all of his bullshit. <laughs> And it's like, it, dude, conspiracy right wing maniacs love coming up with the shittiest nicknames for people like right. the flat earther on my podcast used to call me a globe head. And I was like, dude, it's, <laughs> you, that's you what stop. they do, though. If you say it in Alex Jones voice, then it sounds right. like he's a tough guy. fucking globe head. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So, you know, it, it's like it's all ridiculous. So the this is and he was on thin ice. We've had constant battles fights where we'd go long stretches years without speaking because of things that he would do publicly and so this was kind of the last straw as i was going into fatherhood because you know i have a complicated relationship with my dad i'm also i have a son i want to ensure that the relationship i currently have with my father does not get repeated so i felt like i had to cut him the fuck out of my life so that was about two months before my wife gave birth Um, There was another incident where him and my uncle tried to pick a fight with me before my wife gave birth. So that solidified us not talking. And then my special I filmed three months after my son was born and he showed up. He just came there. He was not invited. He does this often where he comes to my big nights and kind of like points himself out as the muse <laughs> you know like even if the joke is Pop trashing here. him yeah. yeah and none of my jokes about him are positive but yet he's still like i'm the guy i'm <laughs> the guy and like you know at the end he you know, of course in his classic fashion he's like oh you really killed at my expense you know to take <laughs> to take take some ownership over why it went well he's just yeah. you know he's a twat <laughs> it's funny there is like i have family members that i'll talk about on uh the kirk minahan show where i'll make f- i'll make fun of them but i'm being kind of serious mm-hmm. sometimes like i i am actually shitting on them yeah and i don't want them to necessarily hear it but they do and they'll reach out to me like hey that was pretty funny and just so you know i know you're just kidding and i was like i kind of wasn't like yeah, I, yeah. that's kind of yeah. genuine <laughs> Hey, whatever, uh, whatever keeps you not bothering me. (laughs) It's like, take it however you want. I wish I had that type of fucking delusion. If I could hear people talk shit about me and be like, that was a great bit, guys. (laughs) (laughs) I'm glad you pulled that completely out of nowhere. Yeah, yeah. That seems like it was fabricated and not pre-thought at all. (laughs) Um, Before we started here, I was uh, scouring the Internet to see if there was anything uh, I didn't know about you that maybe I should. Mm -hmm. And And I came across... 
Did you host a game show on MTV or something? Oh, yeah. I just put that up on YouTube. Well, it was a pilot. Oh, you put that up. Okay. I, I <laughs> put that up. Yeah. Uh, it was a pilot called Batsu Bidding. That one? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I started watching it. Is that, what was that experience like? Because I never would have, you did a good job. Like, it seemed like you seemed like a game <laughs> show host, but I never would have thought of you in that context, really. So that's who I was, like, early yeah. in comedy, kind of, you know, I I got a fair amount of attention early, you know, and I was, I was best friends or I am still best friends with Chris Stefano, who got his start on MTV stuff. So I, I helped him write for guy code and I got plugged in through him because I, I opened for him at Caroline's got seen from some MTV people. Then I headlined Caroline's those MTV people came to see me and I booked, I mean like four MTV projects, like boom, 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 back to back to back to back. And uh, Batsu Bidding was one of those where Jesse May, Pelu Jesse May Peluso and I uh, hosted basically the American version of a Japanese game show where they would have to do dares for, you know, they would wager money to get to do certain right. dares. And I think one of them was like, we shot a fucking octopus out of a T-shirt cannon and some kid hit it with a baseball bat. <laughs> like that, <laughs> that to me still plays. I love that. But, you know, watching... It's funny to me to watch it because it's so cheese and a lot of it is very socially not conscious, you know, <laughs> whatsoever. It plays right. it plays in a bizarre way now, you know, now knowing what we know. In hindsight, are you kind of glad it didn't work out or because I, I, I don't know how that would have been. I guess you, that's where you kind of get into right. where it's like, do I want success? Do I want to do what Shane Gillis did and get SNL? And mm. then have people expose shit I've said in the past, or <laughs> I, I, how do you feel about that? Well, I mean, the exposure certainly didn't hurt him. You know, right. it, it, it's a, true. Yeah, a few people that now forget what his name are hated him for a week <laughs> and a half. Right, right, but, right. You know, now I bet they won't. They don't know what the fuck is, his name is. I guarantee right. it. So, but you know, I there's two ways to look at it. Right? Is I think it's good. It was good for me that it didn't happen because it. Yeah. Um, I think I became a better comedian. I think I focused on the correct things and I really, you know, I, I, I dug deep into stand up as opposed to being distracted by glossy television gigs. And, but those gigs also got me to be a full-time comic. You know what I mean? And yeah. probably earlier than I should have, but like shot out of the gate, full-time comic with all this shit thinking TV isn't going to happen or is, is going to be my life. And it also taught me a good show business lesson where the reason that didn't get picked up, apparently, this is, you know, fourth hand or whatever, is because the executive that championed that pilot and then another pilot I actually shot with Chris Stefano and Carly Acolino, his girlfriend at the time, uh, both of those pilots got wiped from the slate because this one executive got fired and I thought I was the shit. I was on this trajectory to like maybe sell some tickets and be touring on the road and all this stuff. And then it all got taken away and I was like, you know, wow, welcome to fucking show business. Do you still have uh, aspirations of doing something like that in the sense that something more mainstream, I guess, not necessarily hosting an MTV game show, but something um, a little more mainstream? Or do you look and say, like, I'd rather just at this point focus on stand up? And your podcast. I don't, I mean, I would, I, you know, it's not something that I wouldn't do. I, yeah. it's just not something that I'm focusing on. I'm focusing right. on what works and what works for me is my podcast, my stand up, and putting out content online. That's how I'm floating my family at the, at the moment. You know <laughs> what I mean? So it's like, I, if, if somebody wants me to audition for something, I'm totally into it. If somebody wants me to, you know, whatever I got, I'm doing, I have an indie movie coming out uh, on the 7th of July on Amazon Prime oh, that, shit. you know, one of my buddies was like, hey, dude, you want to do this movie? I'm just it's my first movie. You'd be the star. It's about stand up. Let's fucking do it. And I'm like, yeah, of course, because I want to do different shit. I want to I, I want to try acting. I want to try hosting. I want to try everything. You know, what, what's the uh, what's the movie? Tell us about it. So the movie is is, is called Timing. It's a super indie. The entire all dialogue was improv. It was like, you know, it was a really interesting experience because it took yeah. four fucking years to film. But, uh, you know, it it was about it's about a stand up comedian basically starting in New York City and uh, trying to make it in comedy while also trying to survive socially in some of the interpersonal sacrifices that you have to make while chasing your dream. So dating a girl. And if that gets in the way of, of your focus of your career, that's got to get the fuck out of here. You know, it's like it's it's hard to be a stand up and make those those sacrifices so i don't know the movie is uh 
we'll see. We'll see how it is. I, I, yeah, uh, I'll I check no it out idea. on uh, Amazon Prime next week. How's yeah. the uh, How's the other podcast? The uh, Patreon podcast you guys do. Mike Feeney was telling us about it. Oh a yeah, a few weeks ago. It sounds pretty interesting. What exact? It's basically hypothetical scenarios. Yeah, man. I you know it's 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 pretty much the shit you do with your boys anyway, where you bullshit. It's like it's like a hungover Sunday morning where you guys are recapping the night, and then it just spirals off into just insane topics and and conversation and questions and all that stuff so it's called what's the scenario it's a patreon exclusive for the time being we may actually be moving to a network and releasing a free episode per week and then still maintaining our patreon but we'll see that's not uh finalized at the moment but you know yeah like you said it's hypotheticals it's what ifs it's scenarios and we just kind of me feeney and brendan sagalo are three best buds that kind of just you know we vibe really well off each other so we just take what our take the questions our patreon members ask and turn it into some wild shit you know yeah the best with that stuff is when you actually find people to do it with that you have the chemistry where it's just kind of busting balls and everything right I mean, from what i've heard on irish goodbye you guys definitely have that but that's the that's when that shit is the but you can't just sit down with a stranger and be like all right let's throw these scenarios out there and bullshit about them you know no, and and believe me, man. Enough people, enough people have tried. I've done enough fucking, you know, young comedian podcasts on the road. Then they're like, "All right, let's play a game," and I'm like, "God damn it!" <laughs> like this one. This, that's what uh, Mark Norman thinks of this podcast. By the way, you're kind of my re, you're my rebound. If you didn't know that, <laughs> oh, I did. I had uh, I had Norman on a few weeks ago, and I uh-huh. think it went like all right. But I think we're both just awkward guys. Mm-hmm. That the last fifteen minutes was us both trying to wrap it up but not <laughs> but not knowing how so yeah. we just kept saying like ah we'll do a little more and then it was i said i love you at the end and i think mark apologized to me it was very uncomfortable for oh both that's us. the best that's the best i <laughs> mean it's I, the worst because I, I love him too he's like one of my favorite comedians but i just made yeah. it very weird oh dude i have some i have like i have chemistry with that with like comics that i look up to like just yeah. some people where we never Never quite click, but man, do I look up to him. And it's like, all right, you know, just not destined to be friends. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> how to the kind of to that end, how awesome was it for you to get the guys from a tough crowd in your special? I mean, that's, you know, that was how do I how do I build from that? <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> right. it uh, I, I think it I think it's a great thing that I can't believe they all agreed to do it. You know, Colin Quinn, Jim Norton, Bobby Kelly, Rich Voss, Keith Robinson, those guys before I started doing comedy were heroes of mine. And now, you know, legitimately being able to perform at the same clubs as them. And, you know, we, we know each other and we're cool and they agreed to be in my special. That is uh that's a very surreal bit of reality that if you told me while I was a teenager or early twenties, I'd, you know, I'd be pretty impressed with myself probably. And I like that you left just genuine, like them mocking you on, on there because yeah, like, yeah. Uh, like Colin Quinn says, yeah, that's what we need. Another documentary about comedy. <laughs> like just shitting on the entire idea of the special. Because that's <laughs> I what love I, that you left that in there. Dude, I have to I have to do that because you know, there's a lot of serious comedy happening right now. You oh, know, yeah. a lot of like a lot of real cool comedy or a lot of socially you know, socially relevant comedy, which is fine, but I'm I'm pretty self-effacing and I like one hundred percent pure uncut comedy. So I was not gonna gonna interview my heroes to gener- genuinely tell me that they're proud of right. me like i wanted them to do what they do best which is spit vitriol and they are the funniest shit talkers on earth so to have them trash me for you know the entire special that to me is like you know it's the best it's amazing too and it's very telling of what comedy central became and just hollywood in general mm. and that show followed the daily show like the monster that the daily show became yeah and it had fucking i mean not even the regulars when you take like patrice and norton and these guys but also like frequent guests mark Marin, bill burr louis ck yeah, the guys yeah. that became huge in comedy kevin for Hart. whatever reason that just wasn't they like, wouldn't allow it to be successful i felt like like it never got the recognition it should have yeah, I mean, you know, certain things work with only with boutique audiences, you know, some a lot of a lot of people don't necessarily find honesty appealing. Right. A lot of people want a solution. They want the final like, OK, so you worked it out in your head. Now tell us what to do in a very fun packaged way, whereas Tough Crowd was they were finding their way that entire show. They were arguing. They sometimes never came to a solution and only were just trashing each other to the face. And it was like it was a muddy 
real conversation. And that plays with comedy fans. Comedy fans fucking love that bit of authenticity and grit, whereas the general public might see that and, and is like, they're so loud. Yeah. And I think yeah. part of it, too, is that you can't you couldn't you could never paint them into, well, they're liberal or well, they're conservative. They were right. they were not anything like you, Colin Quinn is a fucking genius, but you can't yeah. paint him into being a racist Republican or some nut job liberal. Right. He's neither of those things and they can't define him. And I think that's what bothers him, really. Which which frustrates me because I think that's that's normal to me is is yeah. a nuanced political and social opinion and you know based on your upbringing based on your your education all that stuff like certain things come into play for what shapes your ideals the idea now that like even comedy fans like those fans the o a people the tough crowd all that they've morphed into like uh, or at least the vocal, you know, online yeah, people on Reddit page. or whatever. Yeah. yeah, they've 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 mobilized into some weird right wing thing where if you express empathy for any other human, you're now a <laughs> lib fuck fuck face. And it's like I've been uh, by some of them, I've been like stamped as this, you know, lefty fucking lunatic that's yes. trying to police words. And I'm like, have you listened to my stand up? Have you listened to my podcast? Have you listened to anything? It's like I might have some progressive ideas and some open-minded empathy caused by fucking drugs and mushrooms and, and, right. you know, personal awakenings, but in no way am I like some language police maniac. That's like trying to murder comedy. It, it's just that type of polarization and people that are incapable of nuanced, uh, opinions and they want to like nail you for being one or the other it happens on the left too you know i get yeah. called a fascist by lefts by lefties and a fucking you know lib cuck by righties it's like i guess i'm doing it right because both people hate me <laughs> well i was gonna say that i don't think uh louis j gomez has helped you much with uh the some of those insults <laughs> sure <laughs> anytime no. anytime you're on a real ass podcast or any of that it's just <laughs> words i, don't I can't even say on this program but uh, yeah but at that point like I kind of enjoy that. So like if I'm going to annoy right. anybody, it's going to be those people. So I I'm now leaning in to bothering them. So if they if if what if being a lefty lib cuck, whatever the fuck is going to somehow hurt your feelings, well, then I am going to be the the most lefty vegan puss of all time <laughs> right. on that show where I will not allow you to enjoy a moment. <laughs> now I've seen uh, Whitney Cummings getting a lot of shit for stabbing Cristalia in the back. When oh, Louis okay. J. Gomez is inevitably outed as some sort of deviant, I don't know what it will be, <laughs> but whatever the allegations come, will you stand by him or will you just turn on him? I'm gonna roll over on Lewis immediately. <laughs> I can't wait. I, I'll roll over on Feeny. I'll roll over on myself. I don't give a shit. I no, but I, I mean, here's the thing: if somebody's if somebody's accused and there's there's substantial evidence or whatever to support a claim that they're doing some illegal predatory shit. Right. I think friendship at that point definitely can take a backseat to reason. You can be a person that accumulates new information and are like, whoa, whoa, I didn't know. Like I knew they liked women and they were, you know, whatever, yeah, a, yeah. a playboy and all that shit. I didn't know that they were like you know, treating us as a subhuman piece of shit and also like going fishing when they're 17 and then tracing back a year later being like, what up, girl? I remember. And it's like, dude, you're a rich celebrity. Why? Why do you remember that? Yeah, right. You can't win because like in Whitney Cummings defense, she turned on him when she found out some pretty bad stuff. I guess the criticism yeah. is like maybe she knew the whole time and didn't say anything or something. But it's like you can't yeah. win with these fucking people. You can't say nothing, but then if you right. say something and they don't like it, then you're trash as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, they'll move on to the next thing. I mean, I think he's certainly going to have a tough time rebounding from this because I would say so, yeah. <laughs> he, has a, he has a lot to answer to and he has yet to do so. Like he, he tried to release those emails that, you know, exonerate him in huge right. quotes, but it's like, you still didn't acknowledge, you know, an abundance of claims. And it's like, if you're not going to, OK, if you're you know, if you're if you're going to plan for people's forgetfulness, then maybe. <laughs> but right. like, you know, I doubt it. Uh, Mike Cannon is going to be in Mohegan Sun next week, you said? Yeah. 9th what, are the, the uh, what are the exact dates for that? So the July 9th through the 11th. I'm doing uh, four shows, I believe. Come out. All right, New England people. Get out and see Mike Cannon. It's worth every penny. Uh, big Mike Cannon fan, big fan of the Irish Goodbye podcast, which you should check out as well. And uh, also the special Life Begins on YouTube. Mike Cannon, if we ever are allowed to leave our homes again, come to Boston and maybe we'll do this again. Yes, yeah, so, well, I'm supposed to do Worcester in uh, October. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Ooh, ha, ha. All right, I'll yeah. come out for that. 
Hell yeah, man. All right, man. Thanks so much. All right, brother. Thank you. All right, buddy.